It's happening! SpaceX is launching its Flight 5 Starship. SpaceX reveals that the target launch date for Starship's fifth flight is October 13th, over a month earlier than expected. SpaceX releases the timeline for the new launch as ground crews hurry to prepare the hardware. I give you the complete rundown of what to expect during Flight 5. SpaceX has completed its salvage missions of Booster 11 as more boosters prepare for flight, and yet another Block 2 Starship has been spotted. My name is Felix, welcome to What About It, let's go for launch! Starship Updates It's official! After various filings over the last week for notices to be provided to both marine and air vehicles suggesting a launch this week, SpaceX has officially confirmed it. In an X post and a post on its website, SpaceX announced that this flight would be going forward pending regulatory approval and we have a date too. October 13th, or rather this Sunday, two days after this episode releases. Now the key word here is pending regulatory approval, but seeing all this preparation could point to SpaceX's pressure finally working. I'm expecting a license. I've heard from multiple internal sources that SpaceX is expecting a license and it might have happened until you see this. Now, we talked a bit about this last episode, so I'll only briefly touch on it here, but essentially, while SpaceX was filing all of these notices, an FAA spokesperson announced that SpaceX would not be able to launch until November. However, given all of SpaceX's announcement and some information we have received from various inside sources, it is likely that this spokesperson was incorrect and someone pushed the FAA to move this process forward. After all, NASA and the DoD can take over and issue a license even if the FAA doesn't. This could be a possible reason. As noted in the update that SpaceX provided, this launch window is flexible, starting at 7 a.m. on the 13th, and it is very possible that the launch can Gets pushed back. After all, we are talking prototype launch here. If that does happen, there are several fallback dates right after Sunday. Along with this new announcement of the targeted launch date, SpaceX also provided a new timeline for the launch for us to analyze. There are some very surprising changes between Flight 4 and 5. Let's take a look together. Here is the complete rundown of Flight 5, what to expect, what to look out for, and when to get excited. Obviously, the big change between this flight and the last one is the booster catch attempt. However, that's not the only thing. On the ground, before this monster even takes flight, it needs to fuel up, and SpaceX has once again changed some of the procedures surrounding this process. Let's jump to Sunday early morning before the launch. Interestingly, while all previous flights saw a reduction in the time it took to fuel the vehicle to prevent boil-off, for this flight there has actually been a slight increase in the amount of time it takes to load most of the propellant tanks for Flight 5. For Ship 30, both the liquid methane and liquid oxygen begin fueling earlier, therefore fueling for longer. 6.10 a.m. local time. SpaceX now begins fueling the ship with methane at T-49 minutes and 50 seconds as opposed to 49 minutes for Flight 4. So a minor 50 second increase in fueling time. The liquid oxygen now begins fueling at 48 minutes and 40 seconds, which is nearly a 2 minute increase from Flight 4, which began fueling at T-47 minutes. It's a similar story for Booster 12's methane, which begins fueling 40 seconds earlier at T-40 minutes and 40 seconds. However, surprisingly, the time to fuel the liquid oxygen has decreased by nearly 4 minutes now, starting at T-34 minutes and 3 seconds as opposed to 37 minutes on Flight 4. It's interesting to see that SpaceX decreased the fueling time for the booster's liquid oxygen while increasing the time for the ships. This may come from an upgrade in the booster quick disconnect or any pipes connecting it. This would explain why it did not translate to the ship. The increase in fueling time for the ship's propellant and the booster's methane can likely be explained by the changes in the ground support equipment, specifically around the fuel farm, which has been undergoing massive changes following Flight 4 when they removed the old vertical tanks and added more equipment to connect the fuel farm to Pad B. For pre-launch procedures, everything following the start of the propellant load stays the same as on Flight 4, with both ships and booster completing their propellant loads at around T-3 minutes. They did keep the T-0 in the same spot. The drastic changes begin after the vehicle leaves the pad, with everything proceeding as usual up until the booster begins to cut its engines. 
For Flight 5, the booster now cuts its engines a whole 8 seconds sooner at T plus 2 minutes and 33 seconds. That may not sound like a lot, but assuming all engines are running the entire time, that means this booster cuts its engines at a speed of around 5,150 km per hour at 60 km in altitude, as opposed to the roughly 5,800 km an hour and 60 km in altitude that the Flight 3 Miko time was at. I used Flight 3 here as all engines were running as opposed to Flight 4. It's important to remember that the majority of the speed provided by the booster is near the end, when it's exhausted most of its fuel and has passed through most of the atmosphere. Every second here makes a huge difference. The ship needs to make up for quite a bit of this later on, changing quite a few orbital parameters, which will affect some of the timeline later. SpaceX did this for a reason. It is catch time. But before I tell you about that, we've looked into our channel metrics and there are over 2 million returning monthly viewers who have not subscribed yet. Help us improve the channel even further by double checking that you've hit that subscribe button so you don't miss our updates. And while you're at it, give us a like and become a Y supporter. Why? Because you'll gain access to a massive amount of extra content. With it, you get access to daily new Starbase photo galleries, including all those we've posted so far. Satellite, aerial and ground photos, more than 400 posts in the past two years alone, with up to seven picture galleries per week. Insights, chats with me, you name it. Thank you so much, you rock! SpaceX cuts this booster's engine so much sooner to allow it to return. If the booster was allowed to continue flying, every additional second would leave less fuel for a return to the launch site. It's the same reason SpaceX chooses to land its Falcon 9 boosters on a drone ship out at sea instead of back at the launch pad most of the time. This problem is less present on Starship as Super Heavy doesn't burn as long as a Falcon 9 booster, but it still has the same effect. Until SpaceX starts building Mechazillas out in the ocean, this is a safer way for the booster to land with more margin. However, despite this Miko happening 8 seconds sooner, the ship hot stages only 4 seconds sooner. The ship stays attached to the booster while only 3 engines are firing for 8 entire seconds, as opposed to the 4 seconds it would wait for hot staging on previous flights. Pretty odd to see that SpaceX would do this. The longer the ship stays attached to the booster, the less efficient hot staging becomes as the booster and ship are still fighting gravity but with only three engines burning. It's possible SpaceX did this to allow for easier shutdown and startup sequences. This way the ship can hot stage at a similar altitude to previous flights but it is hard to know for sure. We'll be sure to keep a close eye on this hot staging event during flight to see if we can spot any reasons for this delay. Why do you think SpaceX waits much longer for the hot staging? Let me know down below. Now on to the reason for this mission, the booster catch attempt. But first let me tell you about my personality. Here's the thing about the internet, it is colorful and knowledgeable and no one cares about the rules. That last one isn't a particularly good aspect. If there only was a way to ensure everyone sticks to the rules, enter Incogni. Incogni helps you ensure that. Take back your personal data. Incogni is like a private investigator, it helps you find problems and is designed for things you can't solve alone. We all like spam mail or calls and we often have no clue how they even know how to reach us. All those friendly emails and calls, I wish we could have more of that, said no one ever. The reason is simple, your data has likely been leaked. Incogni contacts data brokers on your behalf, requesting the removal of your personal data based on existing law and handling any objections on your behalf. That's it, fixed, no more friendly calls and emails we all want to have not. It is fully automated, like the spam callers. Just create an account, grant Incogni permission to work for you and watch them clean up the mess. Incogni gives you progress reports and a 30 day money back guarantee. Don't blame me if your phone battery lasts longer, I told you it would work, here's what you need to do. Use code FELIX at the link below and get 60% off the annual plan. Protect your privacy and support what about it at the same time. Visit incogni.com slash FELIX to give spam a virtual high five. Following hot staging, the booster needs to begin its boost back burn. Time can be essential here as every second means the booster gets further from the pad and therefore needs to correct even harder. 
This is almost double the amount of time they waited between hot staging and boost back startup on Flight 4. And there may be a good reason for this. SpaceX has had problems in the past with the boost back burn. These problems were likely a result of fuel slosh and possible debris such as ice being thrown around inside the booster's tanks. It's possible that one way they found to mitigate it was by reducing the intensity of some of the maneuvers required for the boost back. Once it starts, it burns for just under a minute, going from T plus 2 minutes and 48 seconds to 3 minutes and 41 seconds. This is actually a 10 second shorter burn than the burn on flight 4, meaning all of the previous adjustments allowed for a shorter boost back burn. More fuel saved for hovering. Following the burn, the hot staging ring is jettisoned just 2 seconds later, which is the same as on previous flights. Now that the booster is returning to Starbase or the ocean, depending on how well everything works out, it eventually slams into the atmosphere at supersonic speeds. It's breaking the sound barrier. This speed through the atmosphere causes the triple sonic booms heard during landings as the air molecules are compressed so much that they form a shockwave that emanates in all directions from the booster as it passes. For flight 5, that speed is reached at 6 minutes and 8 seconds, which is 2 minutes and 25 seconds after the hot staging ring jettison and a whole 20 seconds sooner than on previous flights. Again, time saved. Tick tock, SpaceX! After this, while the booster is guiding itself, the onboard computer and mission control have a tough choice to make. Will it go for a splashdown or will they attempt to catch it? Both mission control and onboard computers will be involved in this decision. Depending on what they choose, there are two options from here. But first, at T plus 6 minutes and 33 seconds, the action begins with the booster igniting its center rings of engines. If it was decided that the booster is not in a condition to attempt a catch, then at 6 minutes and 50 seconds, the booster will hopefully soft splash down in the Gulf of Mexico, just off the coast of Boca Chica, after a short 17 second burn. Now here is where you really need to get excited. If it decides to go for the catch, then its grid fins will adjust and guide the booster toward the landing arms, where it will slow itself down while aiming between the gigantic metal chopsticks. They'll rapidly close in to catch the booster as it cuts down to just the center three, then it fully cuts engines all in the span of a few seconds. If this is successful, then hopefully the booster is safely resting on Mechazilla's arms at T plus 6 minutes and 56 seconds. Thus concluding the world's largest trust fall and me possibly having to be hospitalized because of an adrenaline shock. Whatever happens, it is sure to be exciting. If all works out, we'll be left to admire the world's most powerful rocket booster hanging between two metal chopsticks having successfully carried the world's largest rocket to space. After that excitement, the journey is not done, as we still have the ship re-entry to look forward to. While the booster is performing its landing, the Starship continues its journey to space. Its engines cut off at 8 minutes and 27 seconds into the flight, just 4 seconds later than on previous flights. As on all the other Starship test flights, the ship will not be on an orbital trajectory. Instead, it will re-enter without performing any burns at 40 minutes and 3 seconds into the flight. 38 seconds later than on previous flights. Now comes the next hard stopper moment. We'll see how well the new heat shield holds up and whether the upgrades made a difference. Given that SpaceX nailed the landing last time, it would be surprising if there were any issues after re-entry this time, but you never know what to expect. SpaceX is testing many things during these flights. If everything goes according to plan, the ship should touch down at 1 hour, 5 minutes and 34 seconds into the flight. Just 14 seconds sooner than on previous flights. This will mark the end of what could be one of the most ambitious rocket flights ever attempted. Deep breath. Now that we've looked at the timeline for this vehicle, let's look at the actual hardware to see how it's coming along. Booster 12 and Ship 30 are stacked and waiting, and with the flight right around the corner, SpaceX still needed to complete one test. How about a wet dress rehearsal? 
This is where the ship and booster are filled and set to flight ready with all systems mimicking exactly what would happen before a flight. Even an internal countdown is initiated counting down to T-0 before everything is shutting down. This allows the engineers to check all of the equipment and procedures one last time before a launch to ensure everything is working well. On the 7th, that's precisely what SpaceX performed, with the ship and booster partly filled with cryogenic propellants before frosting over. Before you say that this wasn't a wet dress as it wasn't filled completely, it's likely that SpaceX trusts the construction so much at this point that a complete fill just isn't needed anymore. After all, both vehicles have already been cryoproof tested several times before this. The internal countdown continued until all systems were prepared for the flames of 33 Raptor engines and then nothing. Marking yet another successful wet dress rehearsal and the last test that this ship and booster need to perform before their big day. Now that they've completed the WDR, SpaceX crews have wasted no time finishing all prep work for this flight. This is why it was no surprise when we saw the chopsticks again come in around the ship in preparation for the final step before the flight. FTS or a Flight Termination System Installation. The FTS is a series of explosives placed at key points throughout the booster and ship to ensure that if anything goes wrong, the vehicle can be safely disassembled into smaller, less damaging pieces. SpaceX takes great care to ensure these systems are working, especially after the incident on the first flight when the FTS was detonated but the vehicle stayed in one piece. Installing these is the last step before a launch and it shows just how serious SpaceX is about this new launch date. After all, having explosives on a rocket is not exactly something you want for long periods of time. There's also the problem that these explosives degrade over time, so once they are installed, a clock is started. There's one more thing to do for us. We need to get ready for the launch. Go ahead and grab your tickets to watch this historic moment of the booster catch attempt. Meet our photographers at the closest and best spot to watch. Raptor Roos. We're working together with them for the second time. Book your space now at www.raptor-roos.com slash book dash tickets. The link is in the description or call 956-698-9018 to reserve your spot now. There are just a few tickets left. With the countdown for Flight 5 beginning, it seems the countdown for Flight 4 has officially ended. SpaceX has finished its work retrieving parts of Booster 11. So this booster is now officially back from the dead. See Booster 12? That's how you get in the Halloween spirit. The last pieces brought back were from the outer booster ring of Booster 11, but it appears this expedition was arguably even more successful. Over the past month, SpaceX has been chartering the ship Hoss Ridgewind to recover as much as possible from this record-breaking piece of hardware. Thanks to some insights from Joe Techmeyer, we now know that SpaceX's goal in this operation was to recover all 33 Raptor engines and whatever they could get from the thrust puck, where the center engines connect to the booster. After a few more days at sea on the second mission, Hoss Ridgewind returned to port and unloaded its treasure. They were then rolled over to Massey's with the rest of the engines and along the way we got a pretty good look. SpaceX recovered not just a little bit of the thrust puck but what appears to be the whole thing. It's likely many of the Raptors are still connected to this and we can also spot what appears to be more Raptors covered under tarps on the transport. Hopefully SpaceX successfully recovered all 33 of these engines. Their engineers will be able to inspect them for the gold mine of data they will likely provide. Frozen particles created by freezing CO2 from the autogenous pressurization system built up clogged the filters and damaged the components. This problem led to previous booster failures on flight 2 and 3 and is likely also the culprit behind some of the engine problems on flight 4. It is hard to understate how important looking through this flight hardware is. And even as SpaceX prepares to launch in just a few days, there is no guarantee they'll get that booster back in one piece, so having all of this flight hardware is extremely valuable. Not to mention it all deserves to be in a museum. As Booster 12 gets ready for its big day, another booster is leaving. After its first set of cryo tests seemed to have gone flawlessly, Booster 14 was no longer needed at Massey's. So on the 6th, this booster rolled onto Highway 4 again and was transported back to the Star Factory. It's now ready for final checks and hopefully its 33 Raptor engines. 
Now that we're over at the production site, let's look at a couple of the biggest developments here. Ship 34 completed its first stacking a few weeks ago before being rolled into the Star Factory for more work. It's ready to continue construction as it was finally rolled into Mega Bay 2. It was then hoisted onto the turntable and we should begin to see its other segments rolling into there any day now. Looking at Ship 33 after its nose cone was rolled from the high bay into the Mega Bay, it only took about a month to complete stacking. Given that SpaceX now has a bit more experience, it's likely they'll try to cut that time down even further. But this isn't even the biggest news here, because we have now officially spotted the nose cone for what is likely to be Ship 36. That makes four Block 2 nose cones already. Looking at this new nose cone a bit closer, we can tell it's missing a ring of weld marks. This lack of weld lines here gives us some insight on how far into development this nose cone is. It is how SpaceX attaches the header tanks for the ships. These header tanks hold a small amount of fuel and oxidizer for landing, and they're located in the nose cone to offset a bit of the weight at the engine section and allow the Starship to be better controlled during re-entry. Seeing that Ship 36 doesn't have these welds yet means that SpaceX has not installed the header tanks or they're in the process of installing them right now. Massive progress, a Starship launch and a hurricane on the way to where I live with my family. This will be a busy weekend. See you all hopefully on Sunday for a launch stream. I'll likely turn my cameras on at around 4 in the morning Eastern Time. Stay tuned, excitement is guaranteed once more. Hype! That's it for today. Remember to smash the like button for more. This is what fuels the algorithm. This is how you can help us for free. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. A new Raptor design and our epic Flight 5 design are both up. Grab an early Christmas gift. Link is in the description and in the card you should see now. And if you want to train your space IQ even further, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. Fuel the vehicle to prevent bo fr froil buff. It does Why it does not? No, no. If it was decided, that is my phone. Raptor roost. Yeah, no. <laughs>